Okay, we wait wait for another uh, one to two minutes to allow people to come in uh, before we start with this uh, ENS spine section webinar. Okay, it's two minutes past five. I think we could start. Uh, welcome everybody to this uh, ENS Spine Section webinar, uh, which we recently had on a monthly basis. And this is our April webinar now. Um, today, I'm happy to have as, as a presenter here, Bart de Prater, who's from uh, University of Leuven. He's a senior staff neurosurgeon there with a Two major interests, I would say. One is a spine surgery. The, the other interest, scientific interest, the traumatic brain injury. Uh, and Bart is going to talk about a very interesting topic today, uh, which is um, craniocervical junction abnormalities in metabolic syndromes, and metabolic diseases. And there's a mistake in the announcement. It's my mistake. It, it says cervical thoracic, so it's craniocervical junction abnormality that Bart is going to talk about. And Bart, thanks a lot for, for coming here, and it's a pleasure to have you here, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Florian, and thanks for inviting me and for organizing. Uh, so the present presentation should be visible now. Okay, so indeed, I will be talking about um, metabolic syndromes and craniocervical junction abnormalities we kind of sometimes see in them. And... Although this is a rare pathology, um, these patients, um, oh, for some reason, this is changing automatically. Um, okay, anyhow, um, these patients do exist, and, um, well, we should at least be aware what to do with them. These are my um, disclosures. So the outline of this meeting is um, that I will be first explaining on mucopolysaccharide storage diseases, because... This is usually where we see these craniocervical uh, junction abnormalities. Uh, and I will explain what is the nature of them. Um, there are also other conditions that are associated uh, with similar junction problems uh, that I will briefly announce. Um, I will still, so I apologize. There is, for some reason, an automatic change. Um, Okay, I hope it's gone now. Um, so there are also other metabolic conditions than um, the challenges uh, that, that we are uh, faced with in these syndromes. This is not, not the same as in other junction abnormalities, at least not um, uh, when, when we think about surgery. Um, and then I will illustrate with some cases to confront these with literature and come to a conclusion. So first of all, the mucopolysaccharide storage diseases. What is this? Uh, and I will not go in detail, but it's an enzyme defect that leads to the accumulation of glycosaminoglycans um, in uh, the cell and uh, particularly in those cells that play a role in the formation of bone, cartilage, tendon, skin, meaning in the um, osteoarticular system, in other words, and it's usually an autosomal recessive disorder. And the end result is among other uh, symptoms and problems, um, a skeletal dysplasia in many of these. And here you see a table with all the um, mucopolysaccharoid storage syndromes that have been described with their uh, deficient genes and enzymes that result from them. Um, and not all of them uh, lead to skeletal dysplasia, but the most, um, well, the, the ones that, that are usually uh, seen with this is Hurler syndrome, um, Hunter syndrome, Morquillo, and Morquillo is probably uh, the most widely known, and then Maratolami. Um, as said, these lead to skeletal abnormalities and uh, and they affect the craniocervical junction. 
but that's not the only thing they are associated with. And here you see a table with the most frequent ones we uh, see in clinical practice as a spine and pediatric surgeon. Um, but you see that as they have the craniocervical instability as a characteristic, and that's particularly true in Morquillo, a bit less in Hurler and Maroto, but they obviously also have other problems. And you should be aware of that when you plan uh, for an intervention, uh, this will uh, affect your decision-making. Uh, most of them are uh, associated with heart conditions and airway obstruction and the results of that that you should be aware of and take into account. Also, uh, in Morquillo and Marotolami, these patients usually have a kyphoscoliosis. So if you're thinking about a construct, that should be taken into account as well. So as said, Morquillo is uh, probably the most widely known uh, MPS disease that is associated with craniocervical junction abnormalities is a bit more frequent also than the other syndromes. And the extent to which a patient can be affected can vary a lot. Some patients are only very mildly affected, and you see that to the right, but other ones um, really are severely affected. And that also uh, influences um, not just the number of, um, well, um, of failures of systems that are behind it, but also the extent to which the craniocervical junction uh, can be affected. And you see that here, uh, this is a, a case, and I will be discussing this case also uh, later in this talk. Um, so you see that this is a, is a patient um, that is uh, heavily affected with kyphoscoliosis, also with, with bilateral severe hip dysplasia. And um, you see when we first, well, in our department, when this patient was first seen in 2003 at the age of 17, um, that was after he fell with his tricycle and was quadriplegic. Um, and uh, he uh, fortunately partially recovered. And because at that time, um, my colleagues were not sure what to do with it, they, they instituted a wait and see a policy. And so neurologically that was uh, beneficial. Uh, but he deteriorated, and when I then was confronted with him in 2010, he was almost completely quadriplegic uh, with severe spasms, could only lie on his side um, with, with a very poor quality of life and with severe um, uh, sleep apnea um, that was, well, becoming such a problem that people thought that at, at, at a certain point he would die at night. And so this is a, uh, I wouldn't say a typical presentation, but one of the severe presentations uh, of, of Morquillo as they exist. So what is the problem in the craniocervical junction? The problem is uh, has, has many components. Um, usually there is an odontoid hypoplasia. There is an incomplete atlas in many of these cases, or it can be occipitalized to a certain extent. Uh, and the rest of the vertebral bodies are very flattened. Every piece of bone has a dis different and distinct uh, morphology that is totally different than uh, what we are used to, uh, as you can see um, in the images uh, below. Um, and having said that, the, the vertebras being really small in these patients, uh, they have to bury the weight of the head and the size of the head, although the, the body and particularly in severely affected people, the body is very small. The trunk is really small. The head has a normal size. And so there's, there's a disproportional uh, load and weight um, uh, exposure uh, on these very tiny uh, cervical vertebra. And on top of that, also, uh, there is ligamentous laxity and ligamentous thickening. So the alignment, the, the organization of the ligaments is not as uh, it normally um, would be. So how can this present? This can be an incidental finding uh, in, when screening a patient. And I will also come back to, to, to that. There are schemes for screening. Um, and you see, for instance, on the MRI scan that is done in, um, in extension on the left and flexion on the right, that there is a narrowing of the um, craniosophical junction, or at least of the uh, foramen magnum um, inflection, and it affects uh, the spinal cord. Um, other patients present after a minor fall, or for instance, also after anesthesia and intubation uh, with a tetraplegia that is very often uh, temporary, very often it recovers, but it doesn't always recover uh, to its uh, full extent. And then a third group of patients are those patients that are um, progressively uh, worsening 
uh, with gait and stability, uh, with brainstem symptoms like uh, facial numbness, uh, diplopia, etc. So because this can happen in many of these patients, and at least uh, there is a scheme for more keo, this is, this is from the, from, from, uh, taken from uh, a report in the literature, um, the authors uh, commend to uh, do a neurological examination every six months, do flexion extension, um, C-spine x-rays every two, three years. Um, if these patients also have a kyphoscoliosis, and many of them have to also um, um, well, do uh, checkups on that every two, three years, do MRIs every year, or if it's available, flexion extension, MRI scans of the C-spine uh, every one to, two, uh, to three um, years. MPS is not the only metabolic condition leading to uh, cranial circuit junction problems. There are others. Uh, one that is very well known is uh, Down, Down syndrome uh, that can lead to C1, C2 instability due to, it's, it's a bit, the, the, well, obviously the extent uh, and the, and the Molecular pathways behind this is, is totally different, but the, the mechanical mechanism is a bit the same. It's high, uh, due to hyperlaxity. Uh, very often there is an os odontoideum in people with Down. Um, there is an incomplete atlas or it's occipitalized. And sometimes they can develop a C1, C2 subluxation or a C1, C C2 subluxation that gets to the point where it is uh, irreducible. And in those instances that may come with pain or torticollis, uh, and the instability may lead to a quadriparesis, sometimes after minor trauma uh, and gait ataxia. And so that has raised the question, should we screen patients with Down always for a cervical uh, problems? Um, and that's a good question. And some centers do that, but I often see patients with Down, um, well, that are neurologically normal and have a certain degree of C1, C2 instability. Um, and um, well, in those instances, you don't operate on these patients and you follow them up and it doesn't really, really change. So most of these patients uh, do not need surgery. So and I think an MRI scan to be aware that there may be potentially a problem is good, but screening all patients or, or being ready with surgery for all patients is certainly not uh, what is due in these patients. Another type is achondroplasia. And the nature there is to totally different. Um, in achondroplasia, there is no instability. Um, the, the problem there is that due to the defective bone formation, the occipital bones in their complex development do not um, develop in a normal way. And the foramen magnum becomes eventually too small or relatively too small, as you see in the upper left picture. That's usually the case in patients with a Chondroplasia. That's not the only thing they have later in life. As you know, due to the shortened pedicles, they will develop uh, spinal stenosis in the lumbar spine and the cervical spine. Uh, and then sometimes also with a, uh, a kyphosis. Um, but many of these patients, and it's been published by uh, Carmen Vlegeert, uh, that uh, more than 30% of these patients, if you do spinal MRI of the cervical spine, um, you will see a uh, myelomalacia spot just a little, little bit below the foramen magnum, uh, although they are neurologically total, totally normal. And um, it was hypothesized by Carmen that this is probably due to, their, to, to, to what happens during infancy of these patients when the head is quite large with respect to the rest of the body and due to the hypotonia, they're not able to keep their head upright and, and in combination with the narrow... Um, for Amen, that leads to a, uh, a confusion and myelomalacia. Um, this has been further now been clarified a little bit. Uh, and um, so it, 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 the problem indeed is there um, during infancy, uh, usually after the first year of life, uh, but not so much to instability. The problem is really the narrow form and magnum itself. And it is thought that um, these patients um, if, if they have an acute life-threatening event that is due to the uh, medullary compression that happens there. Other symptoms that may occur or that are um, uh, associated with the condition are sleep apnea, developmental delay in gross motor function, hypotonia. But to be honest, many pe pe people with achondroplasia have sleep apnea and, the, and, and definitely 
all infants with achondroplasia have hypotonia and have a delay in their uh, cross motor development. Uh, usually, achondroplastic people only start walking uh, later than um, than uh, infants that do not have the condition. Usually, it's only after two three years that they start it. So it's quite difficult to relate that really to the foramen magnum and the medullary compression. Also, hydrocephalus that sometimes happens in achondroplasia has been associated, or people think that it's to, to a certain extent it is associated with the uh, narrow foramen magnum. Um, but there are no hard criteria really when to decompress. Now, fortunately, this is not an unstable condition, and the procedure that has been uh, commended here is suboccipital uh, decompression. Now, I put a question mark behind it because from series in the literature, we know that people that are decompressed and people that are not decompressed, actually the neurological outcome in the end uh, is quite good. And that probably, to go back to the paper by uh, by, by Carmen, um, explains why many of these people have that, that uh, hyper-intense spot on their MRI scan without having any neurological um, uh, sequelae uh, of it. Um, again, should we screen infants with achondroplasia and uh, many authors advocate to really do that because of the acute life-threatening events that can happen and that can be prevented in decompression but whether or not to decompress or in what exact circumstances to decompress that is still an open question there are other conditions skeletal dysplasias like a chondral dysplasia there are several uh, for instance i this is a picture of a patient i follow with um, with smith disease uh, that has a clear c1 c2 uh, instability but uh, that does not have any myelopathic syndrome uh, and or symptom uh, and uh, which i treat in a conservative way i just follow up on that lady the most challenging one so far at least i met uh, and this is just a uh, non exhaustive um, well, examples that I list here, uh, there are other very rare conditions, but the most challenging and, and really rare condition is Hyjuchaini, which is a uh, notch 2 protein deficit um, that leads to really severe osteoporosis in these people. Uh, the non-fusion of cranial sutures is another characteristic, uh, and there is also ligamentous uh, instability. Now, the, 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 what usually happens here due, due to the real poor bone quality is that they will develop a pronounced basilar invagination and eventually many of these patients uh, will develop brainstem symptoms and this is due to the fact that the skull bone is so soft that actually the the skull is not maintained on top of the odontoid it is slowly over the years like draped around it and the basilar invagination will slowly get uh, get worse and worse and may uh, cause brainstem symptoms. And this is a, an example from, taken from the literature. If this patient had facial numbness, um, a left hyperreflexia and gait ataxia, and they did uh, decompress and fuse her. And because of the open cranial sutures, and that has been described in some case reports, they also fused uh, the cranial sutures by extending the rods over the cranium. Now, I listed up a couple of examples. The, I think the MPS. Um, uh, mycopolysaccharide uh, diseases are the are the most relevant ones or the most frequent ones uh, in in whom you will see these problems. Um, so the challenges are that there is a totally abnormal of of the foramen, so the, the occipital bone actually um, sticking against the the, the thecal sac uh, with uh, with the spinal cord and the dura usually is thickened and there are very strong fibrous bands sitting on that and if you do not loosen these and, and remove these um, it's, this will not be accurately decompressed uh, and in addition the decompression will add to the instability that is usually already there to a certain extent and will increase it so you will have to take that into account and so coming to the instability if you want to fuse them um, Patients with MPS particularly, and usually they come at a very young age, have very small bones, um, often with, with, with lateral masses that cannot take a screw because they're too small, in addition to an abnormal bone quality. So that's really a, a challenge, both for the fixation and the eventual bony healing. In addition, they have often a narrow and tortuous airway, so airway management uh, is a very important uh, aspect in these patients, uh, and you should also consult uh, the anesthesiologist and have to have a, have a plan for intubation and extubation. And 
potentially also um, a, a tracheostomy uh, in the meanwhile, because you can get in trouble uh, with this. And on top of that, and most importantly, these are very frail patients. Uh, many of them have abnormal heart function, have restricted pulmonary function. If they have a pyphoscoliosis, they have also a totally um, deformed thorax uh, that also adds to the problem of um, restrictive uh, lung problems. Many of them have sleep apnea. They also have abnormal wound healing in some of these syndromes. So that, that should all be taken into account. And so the workup is, is really multidisciplinary, including uh, anesthesiology, uh, including the intensivist, because there should be a plan for, um, for the uh, extubation. And, and I will show an example of, of that where it went wrong. Um, the pediatricians should also uh, be involved. And so um, this is not just the surgery on its own. That's what, that's what I really mean. So to um, illustrate this with some cases, um, this is a, a girl of three years old uh, with more QA uh, that actually, um, well, was screened. And in the screening, uh, the um, cranial cervical junction abnormality was, was seen with um, a narrowing um, due to a certain degree of uh, instability of the foramen magnum with spinal cord compression and myelomalacia, as you see, um, and uh, with an uh, uh, hypoplastic uh, odontoid. She had a normal neuro exam, so this was just found on screening, um, but we still decided to do surgery uh, on her uh, because, um, well, although this is a rare condition, we have had several of these children that due to minor trauma did have um, neurological um, deficits that in most instances also recovered, but it, as opposed to, for instance, in elderly people with, with cervical spinal stenosis, um, you would usually not do um, prophylactic surgery to prevent them from developing, from developing a central cord lesion because the, the chances of developing a central cord lesion, that's actually quite low. That risk is quite low. But here, the, the risk, and this is not really science, it's not figures, it's just intuitively, we, we think that risk is, is really, uh, really higher. So we did um, plan to operate on her, uh, um, had an anesthesiologist uh, involved, uh, and also a pediatric pneumologist um, for the intubation, to help with the intubation. And we um, ordered a customized halo jacket. Uh, these children have usually deformed thorax. They're very small. So uh, with the company, um, you need to make sure you have an, an, a customized um, jacket for them. This is during the surgery, um, after removing the posterior arch of C1. Um, and uh, it doesn't show too well from the picture, but this is also after removing all the fibrous uh, bands that were there. Uh, and so we put an occipital plate, uh, bar screws in C2 and lateral muscle in C3. C4 was, was too small, too tiny to put screws in. And we definitely wanted to, not to go much farther down, to stay away from the thoracic junction. And then the combination of uh, autologous um, iliac graft and allograft uh, was used. You see there's a, a lot of bone um, there. And she was put in a halo um, for another two months, and then a color for one month. You see here that um, the bone did not fuse uh, where we put it. There were, was a lot of bone, but it, it, it doesn't fuse always, unfortunately. Uh, but the, uh, the hardware remained intact and stable. And we are now six years down the road in her, and she's still neurologically intact. She has other problems due to the Morquillo, uh, particularly her visual problems in her case, uh, but is going to a normal school and is a, a happy child. This is a, um, a girl of five years with exactly the same history, and I want to show this picture. I usually put a allograft of ilium, iliac bone that I just cut out uh, on a customized way, and I clamp between the spinous process of C2 and the occiput, and you see that uh, here is an example, and it usually works quite well, uh, how it uh, nicely, uh, nicely fuses there, and that will protect your construct. Uh, this is another child, two years only. So this is uh, one, one of the youngest um, that did sustain a fall um, with a, an episode of unconsciousness. And also she was totally hypotonic, couldn't move anymore. And then gradually that recovered over a couple of weeks, uh, except for the left arm that was um, still um, 
slightly weaker than the rest of the body. She was put in a collar, and you, you see here that uh, on the MRI scan in a neutral position, uh, there is a severe narrowing um, of the craniocervical uh, canal uh, with spinal cord compression, and you see the instability because in the relative extension, uh, the spinal cord gets more space. So we went for surgery, we decompressed C1, and in her case, uh, I could not find a way to put screws because it was all so tiny and because of uh, her age, she was so young. Um, so we we put split thickness cranial grafts in her and sutured them to the occiput C2 and C3 and put her in a halo. And uh, that was quite a disappointment uh, because it has been reported that that can work quite well, but in her case, it didn't at all and it didn't fuse. Um, so, well, at a certain point, you have to remove the halo, obviously. So we um, replaced it by a custom-made stiff collar that she could tolerate. And actually, she got very used to it and felt safer in the collar. Um, we followed her up with, with imaging and with neuro exams. And the plan was to then put hardware when she was a bit older. And that actually then only was done at five years of age due to well, several other problems. These patients usually have other medical uh, problems that are associated, and she was feeling safe in her collar, so we, we, we could wait a bit. Uh, and you see with the hardware, eventually uh, it fused. You see also that it settled a little bit, so there's kind of a kyphosis in the upper cervical spine, but it, it has fused. The spinal cord um, is not compressed anymore, um, uh, which you see here. This is follow-up nine years later, and she is uh, neurologically totally intact now. Then I want to go back to the man I uh, referred to earlier, uh, with a, the, 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 the man with, with that is severely affected with Morkeo type A. Um, so already told that he fell uh, with his bicycle or tricycle and then uh, partially recovered. Um, he was seen a bit later um, where he was already suffering severe weakness in the upper limbs, was wheelchair bound, could only flip over in the bed, uh, had already then a poor quality of life um, and uh, had had sleep apnea and, 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 and other problems, uh, but it was considered too risky to undertake surgery in him uh, until the point where um, he um, actually, well, would probably not survive his sleep apnea um, and the um, the, the um, metabolic specialists that followed him came to us and said, "Well, really, you have to do something because otherwise he he will not survive it." At that time, his MRI looked like this. There was only like one two millimeters space for the spinal cord and instability there. So um, I will quickly show you what we tried to do. Um, we first um, send him for a custom made. Uh, halo, uh, because he also had a very um, well, abnormal trunk, um, and then um, uploaded his uh, CT scan, and that was quite new at that time. Now it's, it's quite uh, well, more used to do these things, but at that time uh, we um, involved a, a spin-off of our university who, who worked on 3D planning and, and 3D printed models. So we could, in their software, actually practice uh, like in a computer game, uh, where we could put screws and we developed a technique because his lateral masses are way too small, developed a technique to put the screws perpendicular uh, to the lateral masses to have a bicortical purchase. And what is shown with the arrows is actually not adequate. We obviously uh, will not put screws through two lateral masses, uh, but um, the, uh, the direction uh, is well correct. And then we... Um, developed or reprinted a couple of models uh, to actually practice in real, in, not in real life, but on the models, um, how secure the fixation uh, would be. In the meantime, um, we consulted the anesthesiologist, pediatric pneumologist, cardiologist, also the intensivists, and co uh, counseled the family um, uh, on, well, on, on what we could expect and on the, the high risk of that surgery. So this is uh, these are uh, some examples of the models uh, on which we uh, practiced the surgery. Um, so he was then admitted for traction. Uh, we started with 1.5 kilograms and already after adding uh, uh, um, half a kilogram twice, you can see that already in a couple of days, uh, 
his um, alignment of the cervical spine uh, got better. You can see the posterior arch of uh, C1. And so this is actually how it looked like then. We put him in, in and we put his, his jacket on and, and brought him to the CT and MRI scan. You can see that we actually were able uh, to reduce it by just a couple of kilograms, uh, which um, was 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 a good thing. So next then we send him home uh, in his halo uh, just to see how that would go. Uh, we were very anxious to know uh, whether or not he would have any swallowing problems, uh, how the sleeping would go and, and the apnees at night, etc. But there were actually no problems. So we were happy with that. In the meantime, we uh, with the new CT scan, we repeated the, 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 the 3D uh, model printing uh, and, and the planning. And OK, we went for the surgery as it was planned. So you see, for instance, on the right hand side, a, a C1 lateral mass screw. You see the perpendicular screws. Um, I couldn't show that on an X-ray, so it's. Uh, but you can you can imagine uh, how how they uh, how they are here. And we were actually and at and we also included T1 and T2 in the construct with pedicle screws. So we were actually quite happy with that. And he did well. Uh, he woke up. He was obviously not neurologically intact because he he wasn't on beforehand. Uh, but he could, um, well, he he could move. He was comfortable lying on his back. Uh, he was in the halo. But the intensivists were rather reluctant to extubate him because they thought they would never be able to re-intubate him if there would be an acute problem. And that situation continued for over two weeks, uh, him lying awake, uh, they're intubated on the uh, intensive care unit. Uh, and what eventually happened was that he developed a pneumonia and then a sepsis, uh, and he died at three weeks post-surgery. So um, the nice result we obtained uh, was totally lost, and that was really, really a very unfortunate uh, outcome. And then to end, this is a, a fifth also challenging uh, case. This is a patient with hydrocheny. Um, as I explained, these patients have a very uh, severe uh, basal invagination. Um, and she came to us with diplopia, left facial numbness, so all signs of um, of um, um, brainstem compression. She also had, and that was the main problem, again, as in the previous patient, increasingly worrisome sleep apnea uh, and stridor um, and also gait ataxia. And the problem was going, um, well, it was so progressive that the situation at home was not feasible anymore. It was not safe anymore. And so we were asked um, to do something. And you see the imaging um, with the uh, basal imagination and the, uh, well, the, the crowded foramen magnum with, with the brainstem being compressed also with a severe um, a form of, of Chiari uh, malformation and a totally abnormal shape of the foramen magnum. So we consulted on all the specialists we would need for this. And then eventually after we discussed this through also with the family, um, in one session did a transoral odontoid decompression, then did a posterior decompression and occipital cervical fusion, put her in a halo. This was done under uh, monitoring um, and she was brought to the intensive care. Uh, and uh, was safely um, extubated. So this is the CT scan post-surgery on the midline. You see how we took the part of, of the odontoid that was actually compressing the brainstem. The, the, the real top of it um, was uh, very difficult because that was a long distance. It was very difficult to get that. And we had the impression it was not compressive. So we left it there. You see how that looked on an MRI scan in the middle. So you can see that the brainstem is actually um, decompressed. There's a bit of space anterior to it. There was also posterior decompression, but the uh, cerebellum actually falling down a bit uh, does not really show or does not allow to 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 have a CSF uh, at the back of it. Uh, and and on the right hand side you see the occipital um, cervical thoracic um, fixation. But we were happy. She was doing well. Uh, she was in a halo, and um, after four months, and the, also the, the bone grafts were, were taking on quite well, uh, we decided to remove uh, the halo. And uh, so that was uh, on the 9th of May. I still remember it very well. And the same night, she came back in streeter and heavy streeter to the emergency department, and we did a CT scan again. And what you can see here uh, is that although she had an occipital cervical thoracic fusion, 
the angle of the clivus is totally different. Now there's a sharp angle there. It's not even horizontal anymore. There's a sharp angle. And you can see how the airspace in her throat, so in the back of the oral um, um, pharynx and nasopharynx, um, is actually uh, much, um, much narrower. Um, so there was no other solution than intubating her. And she finally got a tracheostomy and also um, a, a PEG tube for feeding her. Um, and um, she only slowly recovered from that. We could eventually only after 10 months remove the tracheostomy um, and the gastric tube. She could start swallowing again. And now we are six years down the road. She does not have diplopia anymore, no facial numbness, no gait ataxia. So the real neurological symptoms have improved a lot. The sleep apnea is not completely gone, but it's better. And the swallowing, which was a huge problem, but due to mechanical reasons, uh, is better, but it's not perfect yet. And if you, if you ask the patient after all the problems she went through, um, if she would do it again, she says, uh, well, yes, I would do it again, because the situation before was even worse. But this was not, was not a walk uh, in the park. There is some literature on these conditions, but this is actually quite limited um, and restricted to case reports and, and very small series. And for instance, for Morquillo syndrome, um, there are a couple of small series and I, re I, I showed them here. So they also had their youngest patient at 1.5, which is similar to what we had here in Leuven. Um, they did not describe the, the real fusion technique. All the patients were put in a halo in these surgical series, um, also, some did not fuse there, um, and in both papers, they describe how the uh, postoperative neurological deterioration was actually uh, associated with the severity of the preoperative um, symptoms, uh, and they also report on the possibility of caudal junctional kyphosis or uh, stenosis uh, problems. Many case reports have been described on, on, on several of these conditions and on surgical attempts to stabilize or decompress the craniosacral junction. Um, but as said, these are all um, case reports. So the literature does not really always help you. And so these are the conclusions of my talk. Each case is really different. Um, the age is different. Uh, sometimes patients can be really young. The anatomy is, is different. Uh, there can be a combination of of compression and instability or only compression of, of the, um, the medulla at the cranius of conjunction. Uh, what also differs always is the frailty of the patients. And that's why you need uh, to treat each patient in a custom-made way um, with a uh, multidisciplinary team, including uh, the pediatricians. Uh, and it's good to have a pediatric pneumologist with, that can do bronchoscopy in, in very small children because you need that expertise or it's very helpful to have that expertise to intubate uh, the patient and to have such a, a, a specialist ready for re-intubation if there would be problem after extubation. And also, obviously, for the same reason, the anesthesiologist plays a huge role uh, in that planning. Surgical planning should be very careful. Um, some patients can be helped with traction. Uh, sometimes, sometimes not. The compression um, is sometimes ligamentous, sometimes uh, bony. Sometimes decompression enough is alone, but very often you need to also do a fixation and you need to, to, to study really hard on beforehand uh, what trajectories can actually uh, take a screw and will will be able to to have a screw with sufficient grip and sufficient uh, stability throughout. And this is not really forgiving. So you, your surgical technique should really um, be really good uh, because any if, if it's suboptimal, uh, there's a high chance of it failing um, eventually. And also bone graft, uh, position fixation, also these are things that you should think of on beforehand. And it's quite likely in the follow-up that you will run into additional problems because of the additional uh, health, well, the, the, the health condition of these patients with several organ systems that are affected uh, as well. If it's not your construction that will fail or the, the, your surgery where there will be problems, there might be problems uh, in, in other organ systems. So these are really um, challenging uh, patients. And uh, to end my talk, it, it, my experience is when you're confronted with such a patient, um, there's a lot of help, not a lot of help you can find. The literature does not really help you to a large extent. Um, so it would be good for these patients uh, if on an international level we can create some platform um, to, 
to, to present these patients and to ask for each other's expert opinion uh, and advice, um, if that would be possible. I think in centers where this happens, I think nobody has huge series because it's 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 a, an orphan uh, disease uh, by nature. So thanks for um, listening, and uh, I'm happy to take uh, questions. Thank you, Bart. Uh, great presentation on these uh, rare cases of, of uh, instabilities or abnormalities associated with those those metabolic syndromes. Um, for for all participants, if you have a question, please type your question either in the chat box uh, or the Q&A box, and I'm going to read those questions and we're going to discuss your questions. Um, so, so you showed all the, the problems in, in, in those cases, and especially in, in the or majority of cases you showed were MPS cases, uh, and you showed the problems with these instabilities of the craniosurgical junction, poor bone quality, um, and, and the, the problems of stabilization. Is there, do you have any experience with using using lamina screws in those patients? As I found in some of those, it's it is an option if you don't find a lateral mass or you can not really do pedicle screws. Uh, if you stay at C2 and a C2 lamina screw is a potential option for those patients? Well, I think in some less affected patients that could work, um, C2, the, 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 um, intraarticular parts of C2 is usually not that much of a problem, mm -hmm. uh, and the the lamina is is as thin as, as as the rest of the bone, so it doesn't. It's it's not that it is a a huge opportunity to to put it there. I think it's a possibility. The thing mm -hmm. is that in patients that are more more heavily affected, um, sometimes you simp and for instance when when C1 is occipitalized or is is hidden. Behind the occiput, um, you also, to, to have a fair decompression, sometimes need to remove um, the lamina of C2 uh, and, and, and then it's gone. C2 usually is not that much of the problem in my experience. It's, it's, it's the uh, lateral masses of, of C3 and, and lower. Okay, now, now this, this is really orphan disease you mentioned yourself, but you, you had a couple of cases. Are you a, a, a reference center in Belgium treating those patients? There's no such thing as reference centers okay. in Belgium. Belgium is like the Texas of of everything. Um, <laughs> so I'm, um, well, I think several patients are referred here because people tend to know that there there is some experience. Um, I but to be to be honest, I don't know what happens with with other patients. Um, and there's not a lot when we have a, a pediatric expert group where we show cases to each other. Um, but when I show cases with craniosophical junction problems, the other guys do not seem to have that experience. So I, I don't I don't know where these patients are, to be honest. Yeah, we do. We do have a, a pediatric colleagues. They, they have a, a special metabolic center for metabolic diseases. So we, we see a couple of those patients um, from time to time uh, because they, they, they take care of a lot of those patients. Um, and not, not talking about the, the problem placing adequate implants there. Have you ever done cases without a, uh, MPS patients without a stabilization, just decompressing those patients where you could not place any implant, or would you always go for um, a halo fixation then plus a graft placement from posterior? In MPS, there is always, at least in my experience, uh, and I think my so in my series, the the largest proportion are MPS patients. There is always a degree of instability, so I always. Uh, want to stabilize and fuse, and uh, the problem is then really in the the really young patients that are only between one and two years, uh, because there uh, putting lateral mass screws is really hard. Putting cervical pedicle screws even is 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 impossible because they're really too small. Um, and my experience so far, uh, I had I had. Yeah, I had two that were younger than two years of age. One I showed. Um, the other patients, I, I did try to put perpendicular lateral mass screws, uh, and um, the, I wasn't really happy about the construction. Uh, on one side, it held. On the other side, it loosened, uh, but eventually it fused. Um, so, so we are out of danger uh, there. But this is, this is really, I don't have the ideal solution. Um, I think you, I, well, at least that's my thinking of it. Um, you need to try to fuse them, uh, mm. and and so bone and some kind of stabilization or external immobilization is is really necessary. Yeah. 
-hmm. Okay. Now, and now we have a question from Enrico Tessitore. He's asking about the diffusion rate in uh, Mokio population and how long you would keep them in post immobilization in order to achieve fusion. Would you, um, to add on, would you con would you control for fusion? Would you do another CT before you remove a halo or before you remove your external immobilization? Yes, I do. Uh, I do check that, and I must say, in but this is, I mean, these are, yeah, tens of patients, but not a huge series. Um, I I do not have the impression, at least in MPS, that the fusion rate is lower than in other patients that get an, a C one C two or an occipital cervical fusion. Um, I do check a CT scan before I remove the halo, uh, but if it's not fused, I accept because the other thing about these patients is that usually they're a bit kyphotic they have they do not have a normal thorax and it's really good that the, the halo can go out uh, for them to well for, for respiratory function so that's also something to to take into account so um and then it's uh, it's crossing your fingers and hoping that 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 things do not go wrong okay well what's what do you know life expectations of mps patients That's a good question. Um, yeah. I cannot just say by heart, um, and it's quite variable because not every patient is affected to the same extent. Uh, and I, I know adults that like do not have many problems. I think they have a quite normal life expectancy, but the severely affected, uh, it's 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 definitely shorter. I, I, and I think some patients can only reach like their twenties with the problems they have. But I'm yeah, I'm not I'm in that aspect. I'm not the big expert. I could yeah. I, I should look that up. Okay. Is there, there? I don't know of any special uh, pediatric instrumentation system having pedicles or, or lateral mass or pedicle screws which are below a diameter of the standard adult one with 3.5 millimeters. Is there anything or no? No, no I checked. I asked 3.5 millimeter screws in your presentation, so I thought there, there's. Nothing. Yes, I, I asked all the companies, and yeah. what they say is to take a rod of, uh, at the minimum, there is five millimeters, I think, in the rods. The screw diameter, well, there is a proportion that they should respect there, so they cannot uh, apparently not go lower than 3.5. That's what they always tell, what several of these companies told me. Okay. Is there, there's, there are some bands available now, which are uh, meant to be superior to wiring as they're not cutting through this thin bone, and did you use this uh, previously? Have you any experience with those bands? Not in this patient group. I do have yeah. uh, some experience, uh, for instance, in like very osteoporotic um, patients with uh, ankylosing spondylitis, etc. So these these things, I would sometimes use these. Uh, what is it? Polyamide bands, uh, like universal clamps. Uh, is it that's what you're referring to? Uh, these no, these I, systems. I, I, I don't know the name. I haven't used it. We just had it here as an as an uh, let's say advertisement from the company. We're considering using it for for one of those cases, but haven't used it so far. I've used it in other patients. The thing is that uh, if you use it, that you need some space behind the fecal sac, behind the, the spinal cord, there to safely um, make the the curve there with that device uh, because it has to go around the lamina, and there's an, an application device for that. Um, so in in a case where um, where it's really narrow, I, I would be I would not feel comfortable using that. Um, but in in this patient group particularly, I haven't used it. No. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe maybe I should think about it. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's there's one more colleague congratulating for this this great talk. Um, but we don't have any further questions. This is the problem. This is such a rare disease and the, almost. It's rarely to, to see these patients, and uh, you only have some some few centers which do have really uh, some more experience with those patients. As you showed, that there's uh, the the problem at finding adequate li literature and finding outcome data, what works, what doesn't work. Uh, with one more question, do you sometimes use hooks for the distal part of your fusion? Hooks? No, because in um, no, I haven't, uh, and I would in these in these like two year olds or three year olds not use hooks because they're very they have the, the elasticity of the bone is such that there there is even in, if, if they fuse they they're quite mobile these patients and I would be afraid that like the hooks would just jump out. But I haven't used hooks in patients with that that are severely affected like the hydrogenies and you have to go down then the thoracic pedicle screws are 
or very strong the strong part of your of your construct that with your occipital bone um, so that helps okay great thank you Bart I think uh, it was nice what you showed that this is a rare problem and that it makes sense to have kind of a international platform exchanging patients exchanging those those problems of of patients and and help each other out is in, important in getting good decisions in those rare patients uh thanks a lot for this very nice presentation thanks a lot for the audience for your questions for your participation in this webinar uh we're coming back with the next webinar uh beginning of may first wednesday in may will be christopher ames from ucsf talking uh we're just fixing the title um so for the time being i wish you a very nice easter holiday with the upcoming uh, few days and thanks again bart uh, for giving this presentation